as our world races at an ever faster pace. We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. And delivery deadlines shrink. Being in an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people. You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. And incredible operations. It's a little yeah. bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. We get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 ton of weight on the aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. From out of this world giants, life-saving medical supplies. It's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this episode, we're under starter's orders. OK, here we go. As a plane load of highly priced show jumpers kick off. Whoa, 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 that, whoa. Checking in on the Equine Air Express. The worst thing you can do is try and ram a horse into a small space. If they decide they say no, I know horses that have taken like five hours to load up. In gastronomic capital Paris, if my job is about making sure that you get on your plate the freshest produce of the world. Tons of fresh perishables jet in to feed the world's biggest food market. All this fresh produce together is like being in a fruit salad. <laughs> and in Ireland, military helipower flies to the rescue. There's a high degree of precision that's required for this type of flying. Once you add a big load, that center of gravity shifts in a giant bridge-building exercise. When you're underneath, you know the noises of the engines, so you know if there's a wrong noise, you're going to get out of there. Liège Airport, Belgium's biggest air cargo hub, and favorite place in Europe to transport that most noble of beasts, horses. This airport is dedicated to horses. The stabling here receives horses from everywhere around the world. Every day, we do have horses who are leaving to uh, another country by plane. And last year, there was between four and 5,000 horses. Horses are such big business for Liège Airport, they spent $3 million building the state-of-the-art facility, Horse Inn. Here, the premises are made by people who know the horses. We recruit people who know about horses to take care about the loading and things like that. That's what makes the difference before the airport. It's February, and Liège is gearing itself for a truly mega equine shipment. 61 thoroughbred show jumpers for a prestigious event in Hong Kong. And five of those horses are coming from highly regarded stables, Ecurie de Cousine, 65 miles away. They are going for the Longines Masters of Hong Kong. It's the best show jumping competition in the world. It's a long uh, journey tour right there. You think they are very strong as a horse, but in the same time, they are very fragile. We, as horse owners, this is the most important thing to us. They have a good flight and receive them 
in perfect condition to start the show. It's fair to say this sport ain't horseplay. A top show jumper can command anything up to 10 million pounds. So these well-bred steeds get nothing but the best. So now we're gonna put the clean blankets on the horse before the trip because it's always more comfortable for them. So they're gonna have what we call a, a sheet, which is just one layer, which is quite light, which they're gonna keep on the plane. So now I put another blanket on the top because the weather is cold. On the front, we put some bandages. They have shoes on the hooves. If they move and if they kick one leg with the other one during the flight, if there are some turbulences, it can be really severe. So um, it's better to protect the leg, which is the, the more fragile part of the horse. This snazzy outfit is set off with some fetching fleece-trimmed bell boots to prevent horseshoes being accidentally kicked off. But all the pampering in the world is sometimes not enough. Usually when the horses get like really, really stressed, it's usually before departure because it takes time to load the, the plane. And when they get crazy, it can happen, it's by this time. They can start kicking, try to stand on their high legs, getting sweaty or shivering and so stressed and getting all spooky that way, it's never a good sign. Yes, highly combustible, stressy horses can turn into a proper mare. And the most susceptible of Fernanda's stable is Fidgety Philly through the looking glass. She's a, quite a stressed horse, it's true. As you know, the horses are so different, like a person, they have a different characters. When the horse must go to the plane and take this very long trip, I am quite nervous. I, I don't sleep. <laughs> well, insomnia beckons. As departure hour looms, the jet-setting horses are given a quick stroll. It's better when they walk around and they have their digestion is on to avoid colic. Colic, it's when they, as the horses, they have a long intestine, so they can't throw up. So it means when the heat and some food gets stuck, in the intestine, it doesn't go through. Uh, it's really severe, so it's really important before a long trip, they have some exercise to have more relax when they board on, on the plane. After their quick stretch, it's time for Fernanda's show jumpers to take their leap of faith on their big journey. I'm a little bit stressed, as always. Uh, every year is the same, but I'm not getting used to it that. This is the most difficult part when they depart. It's stressful for us. Next stop is Liège Airport, where pro flying groom Matt Brooks faces the unenviable task of boarding 61 highly bred, highly strung horses. Okay, here we go. Okay. In orderly fashion. Come on, big lad. Casement Aerodrome, southwest of Dublin in the Republic of Ireland, is a military airbase and headquarters of the Irish Air Corps. Through their fleet of fixed and rotary wing aircraft, they fulfill a surprising number of vital roles. We provide uh, defence capability and transport for troops, but we also provide an aeromedical service every day of the week, and we also provide an air ambulance service inter-hospital, uh, both on island and off island, for members of the, the Irish Republic. They are also on hand for any natural disasters. During the summertime, then, we generally move into firefighting training. Over that four and a half weeks, we dropped, uh, I think it was close to two million litres of water. Jay O'Reilly is 301 Squadron Commander, and today he's leading a dangerous training exercise involving highly unusual air cargo. Today our plan is to move a, an engineering bridge which will help engineers cross an area of difficult terrain. 
and our load weight today, 600 kilos for the bridge, but plus lifting equipment, you guys are estimating 670 kilos. Yeah. Any emergencies on the way down, comms failure, anything like that will be external lights off, come alongside. The muscle behind this mission is the Augusta Westland 139. The Irish Air Corps were the first military operators of this powerful twin-engine multi-role helicopter. Before we go flying, obviously, we do our walk-around inspection. We're checking the condition of the aircraft. Uh, I'm just verifying that nothing, uh, no panels have been left open uh, or nothing is out of place, and also that our aircraft's configured the way that we need it for our particular operation. Today, because we're cargo slinging and the load is attached underneath the aircraft, we can operate it up to 6,800 kilos. We also need to check our cargo hook, which you can see is underneath the aircraft. Normally when we're not using it, that's in a stowed position, but we need it in this position today, drop down, ready for use. Our technicians have configured it for the type of operation that we're going to do, and they're going to now transport it out onto the ramp, where we'll get the right fuel load in, as per our performance calculations and then we'll get all of the crew and uh, team into the aircraft and we'll move ourselves down to the training area. Engaging all the 1,679 shaft horsepower from the two Pratt & Whitney engines, the massive Westland heaves itself into the air. We operate a crew of three for cargo sling, so we have two pilots up the front and one crewman in the back. And it's coordination between all three people it needs to be really in sync and everybody needs to know what the other guy is doing. The crewman in the back is really our eyes on the target. Once we come overhead, we can't see it. It's underneath the aircraft. And although we have great visibility around us, we don't have any visibility underneath. There's no room for error in this and there's no room for lag. When something heavy is moving underneath the aircraft, it needs to be uh, moved in a very particular way and the reactions need to be almost instantaneous. Soon, they will strap a 1,500-pound bridge to a six-ton hovering helicopter, and that can be a life-threatening experience. When you're underneath, you know the noises of the engines, so you know if there's a wrong noise, you're going to get out of there. When it comes to fine dining, the French pride themselves on sitting firmly at the top table. Salut! So it comes as no great surprise that the world's largest fresh food market, Rungis, sits in the birthplace of gastronomy, Paris. If you realize the, the, the total area is as big as 300 soccer pitch, so that's pretty large. Well, the smell is fantastic, no, because this mixture of all this fresh produce together it's like being in a, in a fruit salad. <laughs> yes, Rougis caters for everything from langoustine to the humble lettuce. And a significant portion of this manna from heaven does indeed drop from the skies via squadrons of aviation freighters bound for Europe's second largest airport, Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle Airport is a point of entry for the European market. So what comes in is not only for the French market, but for all Europe. This demand is growing at a pace of about 8% per year. So that's four times quicker than the overall growth of the air freight industry per year. Of the 2.1 million tons the airport handles annually, a quarter is fresh food. And head of perishables, Eric, must ensure service runs smoothly. My job is about making sure that you get on your plate the freshest produce, meat, fish uh, of the world. From farm to fork, what arrives today, this fret will be available on the market, in the restaurants and in your plate tomorrow morning. Well, that process starts today. And Eric is out to meet the meats and greet the groceries coming off the planes. This is AF410, just arrived from Santiago, and on this flight we are expecting some nice fish. Today we have one pallet of salmon. When I'm talking about the pallet, it's a huge pallet, it's an aircraft pallet that can carry two to three tons. The Boeing 777-300ER, or extended range aircraft, 
is one of Air France's flagship carriers. Around 25% of the freight on passenger aircraft like this are perishables. That's up to 35 tonnes on each of the 300 daily arrivals. We are going to unload the flight and within one hour's time, uh, the pallets will be available in our perishable centre. We will unpack all the boxes and present all the goods uh, for inspection. Well, today, that tight one-hour fresh food deadline may go a bit stale. This here is, uh, is fish. Along with tons of salmon. There's nobody to take the, the, the cargo. There's no, dry, uh, there's no car for take the, take the cargo. Before Gallic frustration boils over, automotive help arrives and the salmon is saved. I see the truck is uh, just departed and on its way to the cargo warehouse. So this is the time that the cargo team is taking over and uh, the job begins. And uh, let's make sure we act fast. Feeling a little alone in the giant perishables warehouse, surrounded by driverless vehicles, is Natalie. We are expecting some uh, fish uh, shipments coming from America. This one is the AGV, Automatic Guide Vehicle. So this is manual. We, we do not have any uh, people on this uh, machine and this vehicle. Without human hindrance, 32 AGVs sift and sort through the goods. 70% will be transited back out by air. But as we'll see, the remaining delicacies, demanded by discerning Parisians, must pass product inspection at the Perishables Goods Centre. And not all incoming is inanimate. On va contrôler de l'eau de homard vivant provenant du Canada. At a torrential Liège airport, their purpose-built $3 million horse inn is expecting a horse invasion. Good morning, Bella. How are you? We are living the dream here, waiting for you. What time, what time do you think you're going to get here? 61 top-class, highly valuable show jumpers will, with a little luck and persuasion, board a flight for the Far East to compete in the prestigious Hong Kong Masters. This is why they call you the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> We're here in Liège, which is probably the best loading unloading uh, facility in Europe, possibly the world. We have 61 horses due to arrive. It, it's pretty chaotic because there'll be lots of grooms, lots of people walking in and out with horses, with their hay nets, with their tap bags. So it can be full on. This is very much the calm before the storm. In the saddle today, Head groom Matt must get these feisty steeds onto special equine aircraft containers or stalls. Then ensure they're well looked after during the 16-hour journey. There's three classes for horses to fly in. There's first class, which is on its own, usually stallions if we're shuttling stallions. Then we've got business, which is two horses, which is probably the best way. We've got a companion, um, keeps them all calm. And then you've got three in a stall, which is what we call economy. So we were just preparing the stall. Um, this one is for two horses. Open this up slightly. So the horse will come, hopefully come through the loading area into its stall. We close the doors. We've got a low side, which is the contour of the aircraft, or a high side. So we have to decide which side we prefer which horse in. So this is the order of load. So number one is a centre load, one, two, three, four, and it goes like this. This is basically how they will be on the aircraft. So you really want to start loading at sort of 9.15, 9.30, and it's 9.33, so we can get going. OK, guys, can we start, please? Can we start getting loading? OK, here we go. First up are some sprightly-looking stallions under the wary eye of travelling vet Gordon. 
We normally put the stallions on the front of the plane because it's not a good thing to have stallions in behind mares because obviously if the stallion sniffs the mare they get excited on the plane so um, mares down the back, stallions up the front. Yes, we certainly can't have any mile high horsing around but thankfully the first few stallions behave like perfect gentlemen. Very good, very, very good. That was nice, that's how we like them. The, obviously, a lot of these horses are very, very experienced, um, and they, they should all be like that, really, in the real world, but um, it doesn't always happen. They are, they are unpredictable. This next one's having a look. OK. Come on, big boy. Good lad. Mm, not so sure about that. As soon as you see the whites of their eyes, you know there's trouble. A bit of hay, honey, a bit of hay. Give that hay look. He put his head down. Come on, big lad. Sadly, no amount of chirpy whistling or tantalising snacks is getting this stubborn beast on, to behave. Come on, little boy. OK, hold on a sec. Let's, let's, let's get let Claude and I get together, OK? Bear in mind, okay. these powerful show jumpers can launch 1,500 pounds of body weight over six feet high jumps. So a couple of humans is a bit of a mismatch. We've got Chief on first. But Groom Matt has a secret weapon in his tack bag. We're um, just going to put a chiffney on him. It's control head bridle, and it just needs a little bit more control. So we'll put this on. Oh, God. Will the chiffney prove a winner? Not big lad. I wouldn't bet on it. Come on. Come on. He'll go, he'll go, he'll go. Come on. In the end, it takes the control bridle and all available muscle to heave the brute in. Typically, that was an English horse that let the side down. Yes, trust the Brits to wreak European havoc. But more worrying, with only six of the 60-odd horses loaded, Matt's already behind schedule. You don't need many horses jibbing to slow it all up to get an on-time departure, which is what we were aiming for. It affects us going into Hong Kong because it's a busy air airport and um, we've got our time and that can be an issue. But things will go from bad to worse, as the old horsey proverb comes true. OK, we'll, 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 then, we'll... You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink, or in this case, board a plane. Well, they really are nervous. Something's really spooked them. They can kick one of these to smithereens. They are very, very powerful. In the Republic of Ireland, flying fast and low over the Wicklow Mountains, is an Augusta Westland 139. Roger, open port door. Port door, self secure. Piloted by Commandant J. O'Reilly, today's training exercise is a perilous heli heavy lifting operation. When something heavy is moving underneath the aircraft, there's no room for error. A 1,500 pound engineering bridge used for first response disaster scenarios in both military and civilian services. The context that we'd use this bridge in would be a river crossing to provide access for engineers and generally used in inclement weather or emergency scenarios. Are they taking that off this? Yeah, that's what Tracy's talking to the guys about now. This bridge weighs about 600 kilos, plus our lifting equipment rounds it up to about 700 kilos in total, which we're going to attach to the underside of the aircraft. Uh, the hook on the underside of the aircraft can take a total of 2,200 kilos. And once the rig is prepared by our riggers here, we will bring the aircraft overhead. They'll attach it to the underside of the aircraft, and then we're going to transport this bridge across the far side of this training area to a river crossing scenario. Making sure this bridge doesn't hit troubled waters on the lift is Flight Sergeant Tracy Walsh. Coming up to the load, the first thing we'll do before anything else, the guys have already started it here. The initial thing would be to check, checking in around the area is clear of foreign objects. Clear. 
We make sure that there's nothing else loose, no hanging straps coming down. Um, that could go up into the aircraft if it took to flight. Generally, these things are never easy to set up. The last thing you want to do is introduce uh, someone being injured and then having to be helicoptered out of here to hospital. There's a loose one down there. You can check all the connections that they're secured. This thing's here. While Tracy and her ground crew check every nook and cranny of the unassembled bridge, Jay assesses the load's drop zone. What I'm looking at now, I'm looking at the terrain around here. I'm looking particularly at the height of the trees. I'm happy that there's no wires in the area, but obviously we're down in a depression, so we're going to need to factor that into our plan. We're going to need to do a power assessment before we come in. Checks done. It's time to put training into practice and hope it's not a bridge too far. Have you been under a heli before, yeah? Yeah. OK, yeah. that's all right. When you know the downdraft is going to get you. To stay airborne, this six-ton aircraft displaces its equivalent weight in air. This powerful force is known as downdraft or downwash. This is the most dangerous time. Battling the breeze, and with the aircraft just inches above her head, Tracy knows the pilot is flying blind. While the wheel of comms when the aircraft is coming in, when it's overhead, comms don't work, you're not going to hear them, so everything is on hand signal. We're signalling to the crewman, and when we're coming in and out, we're hand using hand signals the whole time. One strap is safely on the chopper. Now they'll need to attach this to the bridge cable while avoiding a swinging cargo hook in 115 mile an hour downdraft. When you're underneath, you know the noises of the engines, so you know if there's a wrong noise, you're going to get out of there. The bridge may have liftoff, but it still needs to touch down at the hazardous drop zone ringed with 120-foot pine trees. Because of the tightness of the area, I'm just going to act as an extra set of eyes with the difficult terrain that they're putting the load down. At a soggy Liège airport, Belgium, it's all kicking off. Come on. Pro flying groom Matt is battling to get 60-odd headstrong show jumpers to load onto aircraft shipping stalls. In time for the 1.05 p.m. flight to Hong Kong via Abu Dhabi. We're about a third of the way through, so we're just about on time, I think. If we just keep moving, hopefully everything's loading really well and uh, we should be for an untimed departure. Fingers crossed. But just when Matt's desperate for some much-needed luck, on, big lad. along comes a dark horse. Come on, big boy. Yep, yep. This one's a bit, bit naughty, apparently. OK, we'll, 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 we'll that. We'll. Keep you nice and calm. Whoa, 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 whoa. Good lad, come on. Oh, lad. Oh, lad. I thought, try a little push, OK? Rich? We'll try a little push. OK, just stay there. Here we go. Come on, big lad. No amount of coaxing and cajoling is going to make this show jumper jump on board. OK. Because their jumpers are naturally flare, whereas a dressage horse is sort of a bit more disciplined, these have got to have a bit of their own mind. It can be a little bit <laughs> frustrating, to say the least. With this horse refusing to budge, Matt and Vet Gordon play their ace what they call sleepy juice. We don't want to get too physical with them. We want to encourage them as much as we can, give them a little push, and if that's not going to work, really, the next step is a little bit of sedative, um, intravenously, administered by the vet. And that just calms them down. So it's loaded in a relaxed way. Come on. There we go. Oh, well done, Gordon. Well done. Very good. It's another batch of stubborn show jumpers in the can. But time is fast running away from Matt. 
We're well on the way, but I wanted to be finished in 10 minutes, and we're not going to be. We're going to be an hour late, I would think. Hovering anxiously nearby is Horse Inn supervisor Christian. And like a good racehorse handicapper, he's keeping a close eye on the weights. When the, uh, the horses are going out outside, it's a scale on the first places, and every cage is passing on it. I take the weight, and the weight will be sent immediately to the office. The loadmaster will know how to balance the, uh, the plane. Accompanying the horses as they get weighed, then loaded, is aeroplane groom Tim. They'll get trolleyed up straight in front of the, the high lift, and then they go up. And then once they're on the plane, it's got a really easy system where the floor rolls, and then they just roll them into place. Once we start going, then it's actually quite fast because these three will load while the next three are being loaded over there. Um, and then it's kind of like a conveyor belt and then we get going and then there's a bit of momentum and then we can get gone. As the horse crates are rolled into the aircraft, a Boeing 777 freighter, equipped with specially designed ventilation and temperature control, Loadmaster Joanne has the critical job of preventing it getting lopsided and falling at the first. Preferably we try and put the lightest horses at the front, uh, work our way heaviest towards the backs, just for the trim purpose for the aircraft. We've got this main deck control system, driving it onto the aircraft. We're just gonna drive both of the horse stalls forward, okay? And we're gonna go. There we go. So that just drives it straight down. Because it's livestock, the horses come first, they safety the horses, um, ensure they know they're not in distress, um, and we try to make it as comfortable as possible for them. So we have four locking restraints which are in front of the horse door for the restraint going forward. We have four locking restraints at the, at the back for any turbulence. Uh, so that's uh, just a, extra restraint for the movement of the horses. Locked and loaded, Groom Tim is one of those responsible for treating these noble beasts like royalty. Hey, baby. This is the triple stall, so it's a little bit more cramped. This is my one, so he's got his hay and his water. And then we'll just regularly come in and check that he's happy. Um, and then he'll have a couple of feeds on the flight because, I mean, altogether it's 16 hours. Everybody does things differently, but I try and keep mine so they can graze their way through. I give them a net, a big net with small holes, and that just keeps them busy for hours on end. Well, Tim's show jumpers may have to wait for takeoff longer than thought. Over at Horse Inn, Matt still got his hands full, meaning the aircraft load has ground to a halt. I think we had some bad loaders. The worst thing you can do is try and ram a horse into a small space because then if they decide they say no, they run backwards and I know horses that have taken like five hours to load a horse. Do you know what time we're supposed to actually leave? Uh, 1.05, local. No, I think we'll be late. At Charles de Gaulle Airport, outside Paris, the clock is ticking. The objective is to get the perishable as fresh as possible on your plate in the minimum time frame. France normally frowns upon fast food, but head of perishables, Eric, has made it his mission to whisk produce from far-flung farms to our forks in just 48 hours, whatever the season. So if you don't want to eat carrots and potatoes in winter, well, you might as well import mangoes, avocados, uh, okra. As the consumer experience has changed over the, over the years. Uh, I remember I used to uh, buy avocados and they were hard as a stone. So I would just put it aside, wait for a few days, probably forgot the avocado, and by the time I wanted to eat it, I just would put it in the rubbish bin because it was not good enough. Today, things are very different. Within a few hours of touchdown, a panoply of exotic perishables has been unloaded, computer categorized, and now the portion allotted for the Parisians is ready for the inspector's perusal. Now we are moving to the meat area, where we have received some uh, nice uh, 
shipments of meat from Argentina. They are going to inspect the meat. Bonjour. This gentleman is going to enter the area and will uh, remove the net from the pallet, take the carcass of meat and hang it on the hooks, like if you will go to the, to the butcher. And this is a unique equipment uh, that you do not find uh, in all airports. Huh? The purpose of uh, keeping the meat standing is because otherwise the meat will get the match because one piece of meat touching the other is not something that you want to have. At least this meat won't bite back. This consignment of Canadian crustaceans present a bigger challenge. Je prends encore un colis, je regarde les mêmes choses. Donc là ça provient bien origine Canada, on est d'accord. Et je cherche l'agrément ici. Donc c'est bon. Voilà. Et on a de beaux homards vivants. Je vais vous en sortir un. Voilà. Ils sont rangés dans des logettes. Et voilà. Donc le contrôle d'identité, il est bon. On a bien des homards qui proviennent bien du bon établissement. Tout va bien. Having passed their physical, the lobsters are cleared for consumption. The rest of the fresh food pallets are broken down into individual orders before being loaded onto trucks for immediate distribution. And the pick of the world's prime produce ends up here. Runji's Market. But this happens to be the largest wholesale market of fresh produce in the world. Huh? That's pretty big. So it's five o'clock in the morning. As you can see, it's quite busy, huh? because all these uh, fruits and vegetables are going to be uh, purchased basically from restaurants. Not only restaurants, but also people who have their, their grocery shops. Let's see if we find some uh, exotic food around. Nice fruit here, huh? the pitaya, dragon fruit. We fly this from Colombia, and here you have all the red fruits. Amazing colors, huh? Nice mangoes here. All this arrived yesterday only, huh? The, the ideal world would be to have a tree or a plantation that just take the fruit or the produce out of the ground and eat it. So we are trying to get as close as possible to this experience. Employing 13,000 people, and dealing with 26,000 vehicle deliveries a day, this massive market has an annual turnover of a whopping 7.6 billion pounds. At the end of the day, when I go back home tonight and I, when I go to the grocery shop, <laughs> I have a vague idea of what is behind the scene and uh, really enjoy it. It's a good job, because to keep up with soaring demand, aircraft are already arriving bringing in more fancy food to help keep the world's biggest larder fully stocked. Back in the Irish Republic, an Augusta Westland 139 helicopter is hauling a 1,500-pound modular bridge cross-country. And taking control is pilot Jay. There's a high degree of precision that's required for this type of flying. The aircraft itself has a certain center of gravity, but once you add a big load, that center of gravity shifts. So what that means is that the aircraft handles very, very differently. You generally fly them at lower speeds than the aircraft would normally fly at. So it means that you don't have good aerodynamic effect over the aircraft keeping it stable. On this training exercise, the bridge will be airlifted to a tricky drop zone, guarded by tall trees. Off Whiskey 274, this is Lima Papa Message, over. So Flight Sergeant Tracy needs to be on code red. We're in position now. Uh, do you want to mechanically unhook yourselves or do you want us to take the load off from underneath, over? OK, they're going to cut the load themselves. Because of the tightness of the area, I'm just going to act as a marshaller for the aircraft, for the pilots. Well, they will be listening to the crew, and it's just an extra set of eyes with the difficult terrain uh, that they're putting the load down. Mission completed. Just have the final part to do. 
Um, we get the engineers. We've got them as close as we could to the location where they're putting up the bridge. Uh, when they're finished, we'll be back here ready to pack it up again and bring it back. With the load safely delivered, Corporal Declan Killeen and his section of engineers dismantled this flat pack bridge. Once you have a well-trained crew, it becomes second nature to them, you know. They, every man knows his job. We've got an outer frame on the bridge itself, so that's keeping all the modules intact. They're going to strip that down. When they've that down then, we'll take the modules length by length, as into what we need down to the bridge side itself. Turn left, lift. Just mind your foot. Within minutes, the bridge is manhandled down to the nearby river. Drop it down, go back. Up. The Irish Corps of Engineers are construction specialists, honing their skills on UN deployments across Africa. Ready? Prepare to boom. Boom. Steady. One last shove. Three, two, one. Ow. Here now, at this stage, the bridge is complete. As we know, it was dropped in by air there, what, 10, 15 minutes ago. Disassembled, brought down, connected up, rolled across the rollers. Personnel have got safely across the river itself. One, two, three, and a... That's it. Keep it going, keep it going. Having schlepped through this exhaustive bridge exercise, the whole process goes into reverse. We'll give it a check over visually to make sure that there's no any, any loose ends. All pins are in, that there's nothing hanging off. Hand over to the Land and Point commanders, they do their checks, and likewise, they'll make sure everything's 100%. Job done and dusted. Returning back to base at Baldonnell, Squadron Commander J. O'Reilly reflects on a successful operation. Well, that's it, that's the end of our day's flying. Mission complete, all the training objectives were achieved. Uh, so since the flight ops are finished, we hand the aircraft back to our maintenance squadron, 303, and they're going to conduct a daily inspection on this aircraft and have it, have it ready for tomorrow's either training or operations, and we'll see what tomorrow brings. At Liège Airport in Belgium, the epic horse load is entering its final furlong. OK. Good lad. Very good, Trevian. Among the 61 show jumpers destined for the prestigious Hong Kong Masters is a group of five we followed from the renowned stables Ecurie de Cousine. The Longines Masters of Hong Kong is the best show jumping competition in the world. But it's a long journey to arrive there. Sadly, though, their nervous novice flyer through the looking glass is nowhere to be seen. So the horse through the looking glass, is that, that's not flying now? Yes, the owner decided it's not going to travel. Anymore. Okay, so, all right, so that gives us some that's flexibility. That's going to be a double storm. Yeah. Yes, okay. All right. Okay, thank you. Although her young filly proved too agitated to fly, at least owner Fernanda wins the loading prize for best behaved show jumpers. Very good. Yeah, that stable gets 10 out of 10. They can come again. Oh, la, la. Right, that's the end of the load. Uh, we have to just put some equipment on the empty stall, so I've got one more stall to load. We're about half an hour late, which everything considered, I think, is, is pretty good going, really. If you have one or two horses that maybe are a bit reluctant, it just adds time. Which we but Matt's work is far from over. Merci, merci. Once on the giant Boeing 777 horse freighter, he'll be one of eight grooms looking after 61 extremely valuable thoroughbreds for a mammoth 16-hour journey. I'm just going to go through and uh, have a walk at the horses. All the horses have settled really well, they're all relaxed, no horses kicking off. Obviously, the, the horses' welfare always comes first. So I, I will be walking around, making sure that all, all the buckets have got water in, just, just observing the horses, making sure they're looking healthy and well. We want a nice, relaxed flight, that, that's, that's what we're aiming for. That's on. Yes. Well, it's, it's, it's amazing how they just settle in there, they just get in, they've got the hay net, you know, 
because they could be at home. Good lad. They look really good, very good. Very pleased. In a giant plume of spray, the 777 freighter with 69 tons of prime show jumpers on board heads east for the Hong Kong Masters and a giant leap for horse kind. There, owner Fernanda would clean sweep the Asian Junior Challenge, her horses claiming the top five positions. Next time, there's more crazy cargo, more fabulous freighters, and more demanding deadlines to hit as Mega Air cranks it up to the max. <laughs>